following is a special presentation of HBO's Sports of the 20th Century. And right now, Thomas Hearns is an open book for Ray Leonard. Backs up against the ropes. This is one of the most unusual calls by a referee in the history of the sport. The first loss. A tremendous victory. Leonard fighting off the ropes. It happened. It happened. Number cut by. Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at the stories behind Chavez Taylor, one of the most memorable fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. As St. Patrick's Day 1990 approached, the boxing world was still in shock from Mike Tyson's stunning loss to Buster Douglas just one month before. So what next? 80 pounds south of the heavyweights, a classic battle brood between legendary unbeaten champion Julio Cesar Chavez of Mexico and unbeaten American Meldrick Taylor. Could a little man's fight live up to the drama, the spirit, and the controversy of what had taken place in Tokyo? Could it ever? There are fights where you lose your prime in a single bout. When you fight a fight like that, you are never the same. A piece of you stays there. The accumulation of punishment was brutal. It destroyed him as a fighter. It ruined him. After that, it all was on the downside. That loss. That loss did it. The one thing that he should have gotten was the satisfaction of the victory because he beat him for 35 minutes and 58 seconds. On the final day of competition at the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles, a teenager from Philadelphia climbed into the ring, ready for his final bout in the 125-pound weight class. He was part of one of the best American boxing teams ever assembled including future Hall of Famers Evander Holyfield and Purnell Whitaker. Their take would be eight gold medals. Meldrick Taylor was trying to make it nine. And when he got to the Olympic Games, he was 17 years old. He was sort of the baby of that team and a vastly talented fighter. But you had much bigger names on that team, much older guys. The winner. In the red corner, Meldrick Taylor of the United States of America. Well, once he became a pro, uh, he quickly became the, the class of that class. Meldrick became the star. Taylor with a good left again, and Letcher goes down. He developed faster. Good stuff from Meldrick Taylor. He was flashier. Meldrick's speed certainly has to be respected. He could do everything. A lot of people thought he was a new Ray Leonard. Melody Taylor was dazzling. He had hand speed, he had good foot movement. I don't know if there's been too many fighters in the last 25 years who were any more fun to watch. They could snap off these seven, eight punch combinations just in the blur of an eye. But I think his greatest strength and perhaps his greatest weakness was he was a Philadelphia fighter. <laughs> he thought of himself as a fighter more than a boxer. <laughs> which was the tradition passed down through the years in gritty North Philadelphia, a boxing neighborhood renowned for its gym wars and for producing legends like Smokin' Joe Frazier. As a kid growing up in North Philly, Meldrick Taylor wrote a promise to himself in black magic marker. It read, I will be a champion someday. To do so, he would box and fight the Philadelphia way. A Philadelphia fighter is basically fighters that has a lot of heart, a lot of desire. They come to fight every minute, every round. He had the mindset and he had the history. This is my home. What Meldrick wanted to be, in a way, 
Let's go for right here. Meldrick Taylor was too much of a Philadelphia fighter. He had real quickness and boxing skills, but that he loved to get in there and fight. And sometimes when it wasn't to his best advantage. He's flailing away. This is a brawl. But that's what made him the outstanding young fighter he was. In just his 21st professional bout, Taylor fulfilled his childhood dream. A wicked right hand by Taylor. When he upset Buddy McGirt to win his first title. And the brand new junior welterweight champion, Meldrick TNT Taylor. He was in demand. Uh, the crowd loved him. TV loved him. He entertained. He threw punches. He boxed. He danced. For Flash, you couldn't beat Melvin Taylor. But Taylor, with his Philadelphia heart, was determined to prove himself as more than Flash. What better way than to beat the least flashy fighter in the sport? A budding legend who appeared to be Taylor's polar opposite in nearly every way. Mexico's Julio Cesar Chavez. Chavez! Chavez was regarded as the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter in the world, but more than that, he was regarded as the toughest son of a bitch in boxing. He articulated all the virtues that Mexican fighters are supposed to have. He didn't submit to the odds. He kept coming. Julio Cesar Chavez was only 27 years old, but since rising from an impoverished upbringing in Culiacan, Mexico, he had already earned the stature of a Mexican folk hero. Chavez is something different, something extra natural. Julio Cesar Chavez! Chavez always fights for the Mexican flag. People, they don't care, they don't want to war just to see him fight. What Mexican fight fans loved about Julio Cesar Chavez is that he endured incredible amounts of pain in order to win fights for them. That's the Mexican passion. Outlast, outwork, outfight, outbattle. By 1990, Chavez had already won four titles and successfully defended them 13 times. His undefeated record gave him an aura of invincibility. Chavez was 66-0, the quintessential Mexican fighter take three to land one, wear you down with his relentless aggression and toughness. He was the workman. He was the plumber. You know, Meldrick was the guy driving the Jaguar, and Javis pulled up in an SUV. But then he might run over your Jaguar with the SUV. People wondered who could get to Julio Cesar Chavez. And most people believed that if anybody was going to do it, it would be Meldrick Taylor. For people who like to follow boxing, this is what you live for. Two great fighters, same weight class, both in their prime. Boy, it had everything. It was a stylistic matchup. It was a nationalistic matchup. The multi-million dollar bout was scheduled for March 17, 1990, at the Las Vegas Hilton. But it didn't take long for something to get in the way. Every referee in the world, oh man, you, can you imagine how much you dream, how much you... You, you just pray that you can get this assignment. Richard Steele was considered one of the best referees in the sport. He was assigned to the fight by the Nevada State Athletic Commission. He had already officiated 45 title fights, but his rumored relationship with Chavez's promoter, Don King, made the Taylor camp uneasy. I objected to Richard Steele uh, being the referee. And not that he wasn't competent, I think he was competent, but uh, in Vegas, there have been some questions about the way he handled some of the fighters that at that time were Don King fighters. Steele had been accused in the past of perhaps favoring Tyson and some other King fighters. He was also a friend of, of King's, or at least was perceived to be. And perception is reality, especially in boxing. Every time that I spoke with Don King has been in the public, in the ring. Don King and I have never said over 10 words at one time during the 30 years of refereeing that I did. I worked for the State Athletic Commission, and that's who my loyalty always went to. Richard Steele is the as honest a man as I've ever dealt with. 